One cold evening in January 2004, six men arrived at the tomb of a recently deceased elder from their village of Maratinu de Sus in the Dolge County of southwestern Romania. Historically known as Lesa Wallachia, where vampire hysteria flourished in the 18th century, the region was once again haunted by fear of the undead. The six men, the last known vampire hunters who were raised on the tales of times gone by, dug up the grave of the elderly man, cut open his chest, and removed his heart. After burning it, they made a brew with the ashes and served it to the dead man's niece. The ritual they claimed was thousands of years old, and the only solution to ridding themselves of vampires, or as they are referred to in Romanian folklore, Strigoi. Shocking and disturbing, the case made headlines years later, reminding the world of the long history of vampire plagues in the area and its surrounding regions. And, although we might not think that the horror of that time is little more than a distant memory, one which has greatly inspired works of fiction, this present-day instance of grave desecration and corpse execution evidence that, for the people of Dolge County at least, the horror that spread like wildfire in the 18th century is yet to fade in time. My name is Laura, and you are watching The Paranormal Scholar. Before we discuss vampires any further, if you could please entertain a brief interlude and allow me to thank the sponsor of this video, Established Titles, as indeed you need not be Count Dracula to acquire your very own stake in an ancient and mystical land. Established Titles is a fun and novel way to enable you to call yourself Lord or Lady, all while preserving the natural woodlands of Scotland and helping global reforestation efforts. Based on a historic custom whereby Scottish landowners are referred to as lairds or lords and ladies, established titles title packs give you at least one square foot of dedicated land on a private estate in Eddleston, Scotland. Each title is formalised by an official certificate, bearing a crest and a unique plot number which allows you to identify the exact location of your land declaring you in perpetuity to be known by the style and title of Lord or Lady, these title packs mean you could officially change your name to Lord or Lady, and thus restyle yourself as such on credit cards, plane tickets, and dinner reservations. Best of all, however, is established titles commitment to the environment. A tree being planted with every order, established titles works with the global charities One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future to support global reforestation efforts. These delightfully eccentric souvenir title packs also make wonderful gifts, most especially at the last minute. And with their couples packs, you can even gift adjoining plots of land to the special couple in your life, whether that be parents proud of their Scottish heritage or your own children and their partners. And even better, established titles has told me that the first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link will effectively be next to my plot. So, depending upon how many of you want to become a lord or a lady, we can build our own elegantly eccentric paranormal kingdom together in the midst of Scotland. At the moment, Established Titles is running a suitably grand sale, plus if you use the code Paranormal Scholar, you will get an additional 10% off. Simply go to EstablishedTitles.com forward slash Paranormal Scholar to get your gifts and help support conservation efforts in a unique and memorable way. Thank you. Now on with the video. The first recorded mention of Strigoi in the area was in the Code of Law, written by the Wallachian prince Matei Basarab. Revered as an enlightened patron of education and an avid supporter of traditional Eastern Orthodoxy. In the reshaping of laws of 1652, he wrote that some madmen gossip and say that many people's bodies, if they die and bury them in the ground, they do not rot, but are found whole, full of blood. And this is the diabolical law, because the devil imagines himself in every way, and he pretends to be an angel, and monk, and layman, and woman, and child, and wood, and wand, and water, and blood, and tray, and coat and dead man, and all other things he can become, but it is all as a lure. 
That is why you cannot believe what you see on a dead man's body, because if a man dies, he has no blood in his body. But it is that much more mystifying to consider how, on occasion, if they bury him and keep him in the grave for a few days, there will be blood inside of him. Know that the body that shows itself with blood is the devil's lure. Although critical, describing such beliefs as nonsense, the doctrine of the Wallachian prince did little to change the pagan beliefs and practices of the people. Certainly, after the Habsburg Empire annexed Lesser Wallachia and the neighbouring region of Transylvania at the beginning of the 18th century, stories of the dead rising from their graves were so commonplace that they reached the ears of the royal army in the area. By 1725, the first vampire cases at the Serbian border were recorded by imperial delegates, followed by the infamous Flukinga Report of 1732, a report which described a horrific illness said to have the power to turn men into ravenous, blood-sucking creatures. In this way, for the next two decades, tales of the vampiric plague continued to spread like wildfire in Croatia, Moravia, Hungary, and the present-day Romanian regions of Transylvania and Lesser Wallachia. According to the reports at the time, there seemed to be a distinctive connection between the practice of sorcery and revenants. People believed that their dead relatives turned into blood-sucking revenants, gruesome reanimated corpses as a result of witchcraft. And so, a witch hunt began targeting both the dead believed to have become vampires, and the living believed to practice the dark arts. Very soon, however, the hysteria became unmanageable. Thus, starting in 1751, the vampire panic and subsequent witch hunt mania were systematically extinguished by a series of royal decrees issued by the Holy Roman Empress Maria Theresa. Historians claim that she never intended to banish the issue of witchcraft from the arena of public morality, and instead instituted regulations restricting superstition, harmful beliefs, healing practices harming the health of the people, quackery and blasphemy so as to fight against scandals that were shedding an unfavourable light on the realm. While these policies were able to significantly diminish vampire-related scandals in most eastern regions for the next decade, the same cannot be said about the Romanian region, which became known as the Wild East in the Western world. Reports sent to Vienna at the time claimed that the indigenous people were stuck at the limit between ancient pagan rituals and Christianity tormented by superstitious delusions, most especially those concerning superstitious priests who assisted villagers and Strigoi hunters in exhuming and executing the dead bodies of those suspected of witchcraft and blood-sucking from beyond the grave. And so, the Empire was still racked by vampires. The disturbing events reported by imperial delegates caused great distress not only among the people in the Romanian region, but also amongst the Empire's representatives, some of whom had witnessed several cases of Strigoi exhumation and execution. Terrifyingly, trusted officials, military men and surgeons sent to investigate the reports learnt that the victims of the Strigoi supposedly exhibited the same symptoms before passing from the excruciating stomach and entrail pain to nausea, severe headaches and chaotic pulse. And not merely that, the symptoms were also supposedly accompanied by nightmares that evoked the image of those suspected to be vampires. And the Strigoi would not only disturb the sleep of villagers, but also their waking lives. Numerous accounts claimed that the dead would appear on the doorsteps or in the yards of their relatives, follow them on the streets at night, often asking for something, either favour or food. Once rejected, they would lunge towards their victims, making them ill or even killing them. And so, gripped by what appeared to be supernatural assault, to protect themselves people began carrying wooden stakes, as well as powders made of sacred herbs and garlic at all times, which they would blow toward the sinister apparitions so as to make them disappear. When such methods failed to protect them, they would gather under the priest and strigoi hunter of the village to exhume and execute the dead body, traditionally through staking or burning. 
Far from being mere delusion, it is both intriguing and unsettling how accounts from those present at such exhumations remark that the bodies of alleged Strigoi were often found intact, with fresh blood around the mouth and repositioned on their side. How this had happened was inexplicable. They had not been buried as such, and so this could only be the devil's work. And so, after decades of such stories fostering the vampire hysteria in the region, the panic reached unprecedented heights in 1753, making headlines once more and mobilizing one of the biggest witch hunts the region had ever seen. According to a report submitted to the Imperial Court Administration for Mints and Mining by an Imperial Magistrate and Inspector in the northwestern mining town of Kevnik, an infectious disease had begun to spread in the autumn of 1752, striking down several miners. Although an investigation was previously set up by several physicians and military surgeons, the death rate declined swiftly, and so the activity was postponed until the beginning of 1753, when the deaths of five more miners between January and February resurrected suspicions. The afflicted miners were reported to have suffered four days of severe illness, with symptoms of chills, bloody spittle, and a burning sensation. Ominously, the doctor appointed to conduct their autopsies also fell victim to the unknown disease on the 16th of February. The very next day, three Imperial surgeons investigated his corpse. According to the report, the specialists present unanimously established that there were no external signs of violent acts on the body that would suggest a sudden death. The three surgeons noticed, however, that they had not found a drop of blood in the body or the heart. Instead, they found a large quantity of water. Finally, they firmly established the cause of death to be bewitchment or bloodsucking. Their findings quickly spread among the people, further enforcing the belief that a vampire had been victimizing their town for the past few months. Tales about nightly visitations by ghosts and nightmares were already doing the rounds at that stage, so it did not take long for the suspicions of the population to fall upon two women who had died in the autumn of 1752, the same time when the disease first began to spread. Dorothea Fissin, who passed away on the 13th of October, and Anna Tonorin, who passed on the 8th of November. And so, a posthumous investigation was initiated against both women. On the 20th of February, their bodies were exhumed. It was found that, whereas the corpse of the woman who had died later had completely decomposed, the decomposition of the corpse of the former was only partially underway. In contrast to the face, the hands and feet were found not to have decayed at all, but to be fresh and intact, and the corpse appeared to be somewhat bloated. The burial shroud also seemed to have been drenched in fresh blood. As such, Anna Tonorin was declared by the council to be innocent, while the body of Dorothea Fissin was further examined. Disturbingly, an autopsy revealed her body to still be saturated with blood. Believing her to be responsible for the deaths of the miners, and killing and draining the blood of the physician who conducted their autopsies, Dorothea was posthumously convicted of witchcraft and bloodsucking. Her body was burnt under the gallows on a pyre the very same day. Horrifically, the town guards who carried out the execution reported a massive amount of blood flowing out of the burning corpse thereby legitimizing the judgment of those leading the investigation. The report goes on to mention that another miner fell ill before Dorothea's execution, but that the disease reached its peak with her trial. Of course, it is impossible to say whether or not Dorothea was guilty of that which she had been accused. Certainly, they were incredible charges, with some historians commenting that the report reads like an attempt by the authorities to justify a witch trial, which had been conducted without clerical participation, in which Dorothea Fizzin had been forced to assume the role of a scapegoat in order to re-establish law and order at the local level. And yet, whether or not the authorities leveraged local belief in Strigoi and vampires to pursue their own interests is somewhat secondary to the reality experienced by the locals themselves. 
After all, their reports of nocturnal apparitions and attacks on their lives continued to plague the region, spreading beyond the mining town and exposing other supposed witches and vampires. Men and women revered as seers, healers, fortune tellers and specialists of love magic were brought to trial and banned from the region, while those believed to have been revenants were still being exhumed and executed by the tormented villagers. As such, Empress Maria Theresa established a commission to further investigate the report, and in 1768 determined to eliminate all witch hunts and vampire hysteria in the region once and for all, she issued a royal decree forbidding all sorcery, posthumous magic practices and unlawful exhumations. Her strict stance was reflected in her words. All incidents of grave desecration, digging up of graves and execution of vampires will be reported in the future without exception, investigated by the authorities and strongly sanctioned. A testament to how embedded these happenings were in every layer of local communities was how the Empress even had to state that the clergy in particular are strongly warned not to tolerate or confirm such practices from now on. For a while thereafter, reports and claims regarding the restless dead diminished. Instead, stories of Strigoi terrorising one Romanian village or another circulated below the surface, and to a much smaller degree, in the 19th and 20th centuries. Paranormal gossip, largely location-bound. Thus, in the 21st century, the order of the Empress regarding posthumous magic, the practice of witchcraft, the proliferation of superstitions and unlawful exhumations can be said to have been largely inefficient. Whilst reduced after being persecuted by secular and ecclesiastical authorities for centuries, belief in vampiric Strigoi remains so much so that in some parts of rural Romania, the archaic rituals against revenants are today still practiced by the last Strigoi hunters. One such figure is Mircea Mitrica, from the southwestern county of Dolj. In 2017, the then 63-year-old shepherd by day, Strigoi hunter by night, spoke with the press about the case that occurred in 2004, revealing the details which led him to perform a most disturbing ritual against his deceased neighbour. On the evening of the 26th of December 2003, a 76-year-old villager by the name of Petre Toma was driving his horse-drawn carriage through the village when he lost control of the reins. According to the Strigoi hunter, the old villager had been drinking, so, intoxicated as he was, he fell from the carriage straight into the horse's hooves, which crushed his head and chest, killing him. Although reports claim that the old man lived an ordinary life, his supposed afterlife was said to have been anything but ordinary. Immediately after the burial, some of his relatives claimed to have felt haunted, supposedly witnessed objects moving on their own, and heard taps on the walls, disembodied voices, screams, and whispers in unknown languages. Some of the locals also noticed that the relatives of the old man had become paler and seemed weaker at that time. When one of his nieces suddenly fell ill some six weeks later, the family concluded that Toma must have become a Strigoi. Bizarrely, in addition to being ill, the young woman was also supposedly terrorised by a force that only she could see. She became deeply depressed, reporting excruciating heartaches and overall weakness. It was also said that she lost a lot of weight in a short amount of time and became unable to care for her two young daughters. And so, the husband and father of the young woman reached out to Mitrika for help. When he went to see her, Mitrika claimed to have found the young mother bedridden, withered by the Strigoi, and screaming that the creature was on top of her, eating and killing her. The niece told the Strigoi hunter that the entity would show itself to her as a bird or other animal, and then lunge at her to drag her to the grave. She never identified the entity as her uncle. Instead, it was her mother, the sister of Toma, who claimed that the Strigoi was her deceased brother. Moved by the situation of the young mother, Mitrika assembled a group, consisting of the woman's father, husband, and three other men to discuss their options. 
After an evening of heavy drinking to build up their courage, the men agreed that the young woman was the victim of a Strigoi who was draining her life force and would soon cause her death should they not intervene. According to the Strigoi hunters' interview, they had to act immediately, leaving no time to seek approval for what they were about to do. If the priest would have known, he would have had to tell the authorities and get a permit. But by the time the permit arrived, the woman could have been dead. Or maybe the priest would have said no, or the city hall, and the police would have said no. And so the six men went to the cemetery at midnight, where they dug up the body of Pitre Toma. The Strigoi hunter declared that his body had changed colour. His face was red, and his beard had started to grow. At the corner of his mouth was fresh blood. Faced with such a sight, he cut into the chest with a scythe and opened the ribcage. According to Mitrika, inside Thomas' body was a pool of blood. As we pulled out the heart, it was still beating. That's when we knew he was a Strigoi. The Strigoi hunter then put the heart of his deceased neighbour into a plastic bag, and the heavily intoxicated men attempted to bury the body as it was before. However, some local accounts have claimed that the body was carelessly handled and left in a filthy state. Heart in hand, the men crossed the village to the first crossroads, where, according to Romanian folklore, the seen and unseen worlds become one, and where any magical act is that much more powerful. There, the six men lit a bonfire and mildly burnt the heart of the dead man. Arriving at the house of the haunted woman, they lit a second fire and burnt the heart to ashes, which they carefully collected thereafter. The ashes were then boiled in water, as one would boil tea, with the brew offered to the sick woman, who drank it. According to some reports, she was not the only one to drink the liquid, with other relatives supposedly haunted by the Strigoi having had a cup themselves. Discussing this incident, Mitrika claimed to have learnt the dissonant and highly disturbing ritual from his elders, one of whom also taught him that, for it to be effective, he would need to have a strong heart and no fear of entering the cemetery in the small hours of the night. And indeed, the Strigoi hunter confessed that he was not afraid, firmly stating, My heart is strong. I go at any hour of the night in the cemetery, and I am not afraid. Incredibly, the ritual seemed to have worked. The very next day, the young woman who could not previously walk arrived at the house of the Strigoi hunter to reward him and invite him to celebrate her sudden recovery. But not everyone cheered for their apparent victory. Horrified upon hearing the news, the old man's daughter called the police. She and her mother showed the officers the desecrated grave of their beloved, and with the help of other villagers, exhumed the body once more. They were shocked at the state of the corpse. The abdomen was split open, the intestines stretched over the clothes, and garlic was scattered everywhere. And so the six men were charged with grave desecration. During the trial, all defendants admitted to their deeds. Not merely that, they chillingly confessed that the ritual performed was thousands of years old, and that it worked every time without failure. They were convinced that they had done a good deed in the service of the community, and the family of the old man. One of the six men convicted even told the judge that should another case of Strigoi occur, he would proceed the same way, according to the unwritten laws of the elders that never fail. And incredibly, such a sentiment seemed to have resonated with most of the villagers, as one of them declared to the press that it was not the first time a heart was taken from a dead man's chest, claiming that there are dozens of dead people who had become undead. Usually, the dead man's family would reach an agreement with those who said that they were haunted. Never has there been such a commotion for the police to come and dig up the body. Even so, the defendants were eventually condemned to six months in jail, but the sentence was suspended. Instead of spending time in prison, they were required to pay 900 euros in damages to the family and the village. Although undoubtedly shocking, the 2004 case was indeed not the only one to occur in the village, but is the only one documented by the local press and the authorities. 
Between the 1970s and 1990s, exhumations of those believed to have been Strugoi are said to have been common in the area. Since the highly publicized case of 2004, the tradition seems to have changed a little. Now, instead of cutting open the bodies and consuming the heart, the villagers seem to have settled for staking the heart with a knitting needle and placing a piece of iron under the tongue of the dead man, instructing them to finish chewing on it before they start chewing on their relatives. And so it appears that in the county of Dolge, fear of the restless dead continues to haunt the countryside. Notably, in the village of Gororakuloi, the Strigoi are a daily reality. Incredibly, some 200 years ago, the village was supposedly moved, house by house, from the hill upon which it was initially located, down the valley, due to fear of the dead rising from their graves after the plague reached the area. To this day, the villagers avoid venturing on the hill, even in the daytime, with local elders supposedly ever busy calming the restless spirits believed to remain there. One of the elderly locals even told the press in 2013, God forbid they would descend upon us. Every evening I smudge the house with frankincense and pray to the good God to protect me. We have no way to defend ourselves from them. I told my grandchildren that they have no business going to that place, and I don't advise you to go there either. There are people who haven't found their peace, and they harm everyone they meet. Although it may be difficult for us to comprehend, safe in our suburbs and cities, this was very much a sincere statement. After all, in the minds of those who live still in the shadow of the wild east of the 18th century, vampires haunt the living. Far from the image of the aristocratic vampire evoked by Dracula or the 15th century Wallachian prince Vlad the Impaler, the vampires of rural and archaic Romania are seen as tormented spirits who have been bewitched, suffered a violent or untimely death, or who have been predisposed from birth to become Strigoi. These creatures, the Devil's Lure, do not seem to want to stop stalking the nightmares of the people who loved, lost, feared, or failed them anytime soon. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this episode and would like more of the paranormal, please consider subscribing, remembering to click the bell icon to turn on notifications of all new videos. Equally, you might like to watch another video suggested on screen now, including a deeper dive into the horrific and haunting folklore of the Strigoi. Thank you again. Until next time.